Singapore is home to the Southeast Asia Major, which is known to have some of the highest level of fighting game competition in the world, and it acts as a platform for unknown skilled players in Asia to prove themselves thanks to its geography. As a result, you get groups of compatriots from different regions coaching each other. That's not even a coach, that's a posse. It's usually pretty harmless, but the rules on coaching have never been completely fleshed out, and every once in a while something will happen that'll get people talking about it again. Uh, he just got a call. He's getting a call, a lifeline. A lifeline. Is this call Chris T? This is Chris T. It's hard to decide if we should or shouldn't allow coaching because the nature of fighting gaming rests on a fine line between mind sports and physical sports. In a mind sport like chess, this kind of in-game coaching would just be called cheating. But in physical sports, not only is it allowed, it's part of the culture. Many of these coaches become more famous than the players, and some even get to be in Super Bowl commercials comparing baseball to erectile dysfunction. In football, it's the vitra. Baseball could use the vitra. Certain esports like League of Legends have established a role for coaching, but fighting game tournaments tend to vary on what's permissible. But to get a better idea of whether we should allow onstage coaching or not, we need to look at the four ways coaching can be a benefit. One is knowledge about the game. Knowledge. This involves things like frame data, tech, character properties, etc. For example, let's say my friend is up 1-0 in the best of three set against Birdie. I notice this happened, causing him to lose the second game, making it 1-1. I whisper into his ear, EX Bullhorn into V-Trigger is actually minus 9, you can punish that. So in the last round of the last game, the opponent decides to do the same move as last time thinking my friend doesn't know how to punish it, but instead this ends up happening. My friend won because I literally uttered a single sentence to him. Part of being a competitive fighting gamer is doing your homework, and in this case, I just gave him the answer in the middle of the exam. Lisa, what's the answer to number seven? Sorry, Ralph, that would defeat the purpose of testing as a means of student evaluation. Another way a coach can help is with strategy. Having an extra pair of eyes watching the match means the coach can catch something the player might have missed in the heat of battle. Mago, of course, is a Karen player, so he's just... He's like, here, look, I gotta tell you this. This can easily get into the territory of cheating if you talk during the match. Even at the highest levels of play, a pro can forget that their opponent has full meter and throw a bad fireball, resulting in a loss. But a coach playing the role of meter reminder can stop you from throwing that bad fireball and change the outcome of the match. In between matches, a coach can remind you of your bad habits and your opponent's bad habits and form a strategy. In a short two out of three set, it's crucial to notice your opponent's habits quickly, and having two people can really speed things up. I think last time, he got very lucky. Whoa. And this time, there's no Mago to save him. Whoa. <laughs> the third advantage has to do with mind games. A study at Cornell University has found that people overhearing cell phone conversations did more poorly on cognitive tasks that demanded the kinds of attention we use to tend to daily activities. Listening to half of the conversation, or a half a log, presents gaps in information which creates a distraction in a way a full dialogue doesn't. This is because there's a natural tendency to fill an information gap which George Lowenstein describes as the awareness of the absence of potential useful or interesting information. Seeing people whisper things about you is distracting and can literally draw you into the conversation. The final thing a coach can do is give encouragement. This is the least tangible way to help the player, but as seen in boxing, there's certainly more to it than just telling the player that they can do it. One of the features of effective encouragement is that it comes from someone you deem an expert and trust. One notable instance is Smash Melee player Hungrybox. He had gotten second place twice at EVO, and even became known as having a second place curse. Thank you HBox for giving us free EVOs, I appreciate it. One day, you'll give me a free EVO too. He'll get second at every EVO for the rest of his life, and then you gotta thank him for giving you a free EVO. But at DreamHack 2015, with the help of a coach, Luis Captain Crunch Rosias, Hungrybox would win first place, beating Armada in Grand Finals. Now, by the way, here's one thing I wanted to touch on. Yeah, that person that is actually sitting next to uh, Hungrybox is a sports psychologist, I heard. Ooh. So that's pretty nifty. In an unprecedented move, his sponsor Team Liquid signed on Rosias as his coach right before EVO 2016, and Hungrybox would end up breaking his curse and winning the whole thing. You got third at EVO 2013, second two years in a row. You wanted to win this, you had pressure on yourself. How did you overcome that? That man right over there, he, um, he helped me out through every single step of the way. And you guys should interview him too, but I'm telling you, having a coach to help you feel the little things you don't realize is the best thing a player can have, and I owe him everything. What separates these two from the casual coaching you see most of the time is that they have a relationship that goes way back. 
But the thing to note here is that Hungrybox won EVO even after they disallowed coaching after pools. This shows that the coach can play a powerful role even if they aren't present during the games. Considering everything I've said, it might seem like I want onstage coaching banned, but I feel like that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If you recall Chris T's phone call to Julio during Grand Finals, it wasn't really about Julio getting advice because no one would have cared if Chris T were there in person. It was more about the lack of regulation. There are two main problems I see with onstage coaching. One is that it takes too much time, which can be an issue given how often tournaments go behind schedule. The other problem is the lack of a designated coach, which is why we get the councils and phone calls. Having a designated coach from the start and setting a time limit can reduce the chaos, and tournaments like Combo Breaker have actually implemented these coaching rules to great effect. With a few more adjustments, I think we can reach a standard rule set people will feel comfortable with. Outright banning onstage coaching is a bit drastic and seems a bit sterile for such a social community. The same debate is actually happening in the Women's Tennis Association, which currently allows on-court coaching, and many of the arguments are similar. On-court coaching can increase the overall level of the game, but it takes away the one-on-one -on -one aspect of the competition. At the women's side of the Australian Open this year, which did not allow on-stage coaching, there were tons of upsets making people believe that the players were becoming too dependent on their coaches. Whether it's just excuses or not, perceived dependency can deflate the victories in a game that celebrates individual achievement. It also doesn't help that many of their coaches are men signaling all sorts of implications. Considering tennis, a sport that goes back centuries, still hasn't standardized coaching rules shows how subjective all this really is. Whether coaching is allowed or not, I think making a standard will also help coaches realize what kind of role they will play in the future and plan accordingly. Let me know in the comments what you think the rules should be on coaching. This was Gerald from Corey Gaming. Thanks for watching and subscribe for more.